Welcome to a What It Takes Radio production. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and Merry Christmas as we truly come to this Christmas season this weekend. And uh, we have a gift for you. My name is Stan Houston. On behalf of uh, my good colleague and friend, David Chutka, we wish you God's best and blessings at this Christmas time. And we have a program today which I think will be a real gift to you, as it certainly was to me. You know, this forgiveness stuff really is hard. <sighs> if I forgive, do I have to forget? Do I still have to be friends with them? What about all those feelings I have? Why does Jesus ask me to do such hard things? Well, in his teaching today, Dr. David will free you up. He will give you what forgiveness is really all about and then how we make that work in our lives so that each and every one of us can do it and know how to do it well. And so uh, it was truly a gift to me. And I celebrate that fact and pass it on to you as we listen to Dr. David as he talks about uh, what it means to forgive. And to forgive does not necessarily mean to forget. Dr. David. Well, good morning, Stan. It's good to be with you again uh, in our journey through the Lord's Prayer. As you and I are more than aware, we've been journeying this way for quite a few weeks now. And uh, we have looked at the framework of the Lord's Prayer, the, the six different movements. And right now, we're centering in on uh, what it means to forgive. And actually, this, I think, is one of the most practical application sections that we have in the entire Lord's Prayer. And let me start off by just saying this, and I want to make this painfully clear. Most people are reluctant to forgive because they confuse forgiving with reconciling and restoring trust. They're really not the same things. Uh, to forgive someone is not to treat them as their sins deserve, and it's to say, "All right, it's done. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna nail you to the wall, but I'm, I'm gonna get past this." To reconcile is where two parties or however many people are involved in this actually work out their differences and start to build a bridge between their respective understandings of what it was that happened that created the trouble, etc. Come to an understanding, pray for forgiveness with each other, ask the Lord to restore the relationship, and the last one, trust is something that takes years and years and years to restore. And so Jesus doesn't command us to trust the one who's hurt us. And Jesus doesn't command us to reconcile with the one who hurt us, although that's preferred. He commands us to forgive the one who hurt us or to forgive the people who hurt us. And so we have to keep those in separate categories or else we're going to not want to forgive at all. And I think the most important thing we can do is to recognize the value of what our Lord has said by putting it inside its proper context. The most important thing we can do is to recognize that forgiveness is not restoration or trust. It is forgiveness. It's taking that person off your hook and putting them on God's. And straight up, I'll just say this to you. Uh, right now, there's a, there's a terrible war going on between Russia and the Ukraine. And I know this. There, are, I was in the Ukraine in 1994 and 1990. <laughs> and in 96, I was in a southern city, Dnipropetrovsk, where Russians were married to Ukrainians. And they're fighting each other and they're killing each other. Now, once this war ends, and I don't know when it's going to end, but once it ends, uh, Ukraine will have to make the decision that it's going to forgive Russia. But I don't think they have to make the decision to trust them. <laughs> it's, it's, they, they've broken their word so many times, it's ridiculous. Crimea was given to them in 1994 when Ukraine surrendered its nuclear weapons to Russia. I don't know if you know that. And a territorial integrity was supposed to be respected. And now, of course, it's been violated more than once. The point here is this. Uh, trust is not a requ trust is not the command forgives the command now even forgiving is a battle by itself once you've seen some horrible damage happen but it's about us getting in right relationship with god and dealing with the matters that are preventing us from leaving yesterday behind to move into tomorrow it's not about us restoring the relationship that's a different kind of work it is preferred in the sight of god but it is not the command so let me just move into my screen and start to uh, to share what it is I'm trying to say here. And I think the whole point of what I'm trying to get at is that we need to move from yesterday to tomorrow. And so the gospel is not yesterday focused. The gospel is tomorrow focused. 
The gospel is focused on encountering the Lord today to establish the kingdom today and in our forever after, and to bring the kingdom of God here on planet Earth. Failure to forgive leaves us yoked to yesterday. Receiving and applying forgiveness opens the door to today and a bright future tomorrow, which is why I put this little sign in, in this particular part of the uh, presentation. Now let me move into what I call large screen context. Here we go. And it is a path, to, uh, the path to forgiveness is not an easy one. But let me start off by saying also that uh, I am very much indebted to, uh, to Neil Anderson and Charles Mylander. They developed this, uh, this five or six step approach to the practice of forgiveness. It is one of the most practical, uh, uh, processes that I've seen. And, uh, so Mylander and Anderson are the guys who put this into print and you can find it in all of their writings. And in particular, the first time I ran across it, it was in the setting your church free material. It's also found in the bondage breaker and so on some of their earlier work, but let me walk you through this. So, um, uh, we, what we've done is we've taken this amazing teaching and misapplied it slightly. So as we move from Hebrew scripture to Greek scripture, from Old Testament to New, there was a promise about a new covenant that was going to come. And this is one of some of the most famous uh, writing from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, and it anticipates uh, the new covenant. This is the covenant which I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart, I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. And this is the part right here. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. So forgive and forget has its roots in this passage in Jeremiah. And uh, it's a, say, a saying we always use when we're trying to get on with life. And I, I don't know anybody who hasn't had somebody do something you know, dumb to them or hurt them, whether it was a small slight or whether it was a major blow. And so the old proverb in the culture is, okay, get over it, forgive and forget, suck it up, move on, that kind of thing. Suck it up is more a 21st century state. <laughs> forgive and forget was spoken in gentler times. Anyway, if you can, look, it, it, it's rooted in this and they say, well, listen. If God's going to forget, I should forget too. And they don't recognize that to forget is not the warp and woof of what it means to be human. You remember cuddles and affection. You remember violence. You remember love in its greatest depth. You're never going to forget your wedding day. And if people who've been through this terrible thing, they're never going to forget the day that their child hurt them or they got a divorce or whatever. You're not supposed to forget you're supposed to put it in proper context. Now with God, he has perfect memory and he can say, this is done, I'm gonna lay it aside. But even here, this is metaphorical language to say to us something that's profound. Whenever you sin, the people you sin against don't trust you anymore and God is saying, here's what I'm gonna do for you. I'm gonna rewrite the whole contract. I'm gonna put it on the inner being of your heart because you're not capable of doing that. And I'm not going to treat you in tomorrow's future like I treated you in yesterday's. And what I'm going to do here is I am going to make the decision to not treat you as your sins deserve and give you a fresh start. This is metaphorical language that should not be applied uh, any other way. So the logic itself doesn't mess with scripture, right? Uh, we know, <laughs> you know this, uh, you know, of course, that the patriarchs are a bunch of jerks. <laughs> I preached this sermon, oh, about, about a month ago, I preached a sermon on, um, on how do we deal with these Old Testament stories? How do we understand the Bible when we've got, you know, Jacob the liar, and we've got Abraham who, you know, pretended that his wife was his sister, et cetera, et cetera, to, to make sure that he had safety. And how do we deal with, with, the, with the betrayal of, uh, of Joseph by his brothers and Judah who betrayed his brother becoming a leader? How, how do you do this? Well, the point is not that the patriarchs are the heroes. The point is God's the hero. The point is that God always takes us in our brokenness, in our despair, in our trouble, in our difficulty. And he works a solution out. And in his own inimitable fashion, he even takes the very evil that we commit and turns it into a new opportunity. Now, here's the point I'm trying to make with this particular teaching. You and I, and everybody that's read the Bible, knows the sins of the patriarchs after they were forgiven. <laughs> so we know all about the betrayal of, 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 the, uh, of the brothers 
of Joseph and, and his brothers selling him into slavery. We know that. We 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 we, we hear the story. Why? Well, because it got recorded, <laughs> even after they repented. And the best part of the story is where Judah, who had thrown his brother in the pit and said, let's sell him, offers to become a ransom for his younger brother, Benjamin. And it was at that moment that Joseph made the decision that he was going to restore these guys and tell them who he was and provide for them and so on and so forth. Judah comes full circle. But I mean, we didn't need to know the story. But God put the story in the scripture because the point is not that he doesn't remember. The point is he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. That's the point. You know about the sins of uh, David and Bathsheba. We know that. In fact, were it not for David and Bathsheba and their subsequent repentance and uh, the birth of Solomon, we wouldn't have the line of David that led to the birth of Jesus the Lord. And so uh, (laughs) we know that David repented. We know that David was forgiven. And yet the scripture records the fact that he did this ugly thing and records his prayer of repentance after he repented in Psalm 51. We know all about the lies of Jacob the liar and his his name means deceiver. All of these were forgiven. So I could keep telling you story after story after story, Old Testament and New, of people who were forgiven and their deeds thereafter were recorded. The point is when God remembers their sins no more, It does not refer to him not remembering the details of what happened. It refers to him saying, I am never going to treat you according to the way you acted. I am going to put into remembrance that I have forgiven you. That's the point. It's figurative language to tell us that God will not treat us as our sins deserve. And that's what needs to be transferred over. Now, let me move into this. Forgiveness is not forgetting. I mean, uh, this, uh, if, uh, you, if people are paying attention to dates, this is the anniversary of that Sandy Hook massacre. Today's the day. What a horrible, awful, ugly thing. Children, innocent kids, teachers killed. Why? There's no reason. And um, now those, some of those parents, some of those Sandy Hook parents have made the decision to forgive, but they're not going to trust after this. They're not, but they're not, never going to forget. And society's never going to forget. In Canada, we had a slaughter at Ecole Polytechnique, and there was a whole bunch of women killed because they were girls. There was no other reason. Some misogynist, anti female guy took a gun out and killed a whole bunch of women at one of our schools. A Canadian culture every year remembers the slaughter at Ecole Polytechnique. They, they're never going to forget because it was evil. So the point is, you don't, tr- there, there comes a moment when you have to decide that you're not going to, you don't, you're not supposed to forget. So I have the story in my par praying book of a pastor named Dale Lang. He's an Anglican in the States that would be Episcopal. Now you have an Anglican branch down there too. But uh, Dale was an Anglican pastor. He was serving in a little town in rural uh, Alberta, Canada, just north of Montana. And his son was a lovely, God-honoring, righteous teenager who was standing at his locker one day. When some other guy walked into the school in a trench coat, pulled out a gun and shot the guy as he was pulling his books out of his locker for no reason other than he wanted to see somebody die. It was the pastor's son. Now, the story's profound. Dale Lang did not want, I mean, he he was horrified. He was grieved. He was appalled. It was an egregious injustice against his family and against the school and against the whole town. The name of the town was Tabor, Alberta. He walked into the school the next day and he greeted people in the name of the Lord. And he said, this is the place where my son was killed. But we will not allow violence to ruin the good work of this school. And in the name of Christ the Lord, we will, rest- we will redeem and restore what has been stolen away from us. I'm buying it back right here. He did that. Now, he forgave. And he restored the work of the school, but he's never going to forget. And that school won't forget. And that town won't forget. What they will also remember was the work of Dale Lang in going beyond the murder into something profound called the restoration of purpose. So we're going to talk about how God can take horrible things and use them for his glory next week. But uh, the point here I want to make very clearly is forgiveness is not forgetting. 
We don't make a decision not to, we don't make a decision to stuff stuff it. By the way, if, if active violence has been done towards you, or if you've been aggrieved or wounded, or somebody's stolen from you, and you can't pay your bills, you're not going to forget. And if you say, I have to forgive and forget because God commands it, that's a lie. What you're doing is you're shoving all this pain down into the center of your being, and you're covering it over with concrete and le- instead of letting it come to a place where it can be restored and healed. So we're going to get into a process of how to establish that forgiveness today. But th- these stories, part of American culture, part of Canadian culture, part of every culture on earth, we're not commanded to forget. We're commanded to forgive and to put the memory into proper perspective. So let's move on. God forgives and he commands us to forgive. In fact, <laughs> We think of forgiveness as restored relationship. No, 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 no. Restored relationship is trust restored. That requires a frank admission of sin on the parts of all parties, a request for restoration, and two people, or however many there are in the situation, making a conscious, deliberate effort to work at it, and people don't do that quickly. And actually, straight up, there, have been, there, there are people who have wounded me, or my family, or, or perhaps yours as well, And some people should never be trusted again. You have to forgive them so that you're not chained to yesterday, but you shouldn't trust them unless there's a long, substantial trust record, a bank of trust that's been built up over many, many years. Yet we can decide to forgive because forgiveness is commanded. Restoration of a broken relationship is a completely different matter. It is God's preferred future, but it is not commanded for one person to do that when there's no reciprocal trust. That requires a whole bunch of different kinds of work. So let's focus in on what is in the Lord's Prayer. So we say the prayer and it goes like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The whole point of the prayer is that in this spiritual warfare work, we are getting to the place where we take away any ground that the powers of darkness would use to attack us. And that includes living in bitter memory of unforgiveness. And so uh, that's what Jesus commands us. Now, I've already said this. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Remember our sins no more means that God will never use the past against us. You can see that in Psalm 103. Verse 12. Now, I'll I'll just say this to you. There are people who sinned against me and I forgot. (laughs) So, you know, forgiveness may be the result or forgetting may be the result of forgiveness. Forget it. We're done. It's over. But it's never the means by which the forgiveness is accomplished. In fact, quite the opposite. If you really want to nail this thing, you have to surface the memory and bring it into the light of Christ for the Lord to let his power rest on that. So here's the reality. When we bring up the past against each other, we're, we're saying we haven't forgiven them. That means we're still carrying it with us. Now, this is beautifully outlined in Anderson and Mylander's work in Setting Your Church Free and the, the Bondage Breaker. Beautifully outlined. This is his outline, and I'm, I'm indebted to him. In fact, in the Power of Praying book, this book here, I, I attribute it to him so that there can be no misunderstanding. This is his process, and I want people to recognize this, and I credit that toward him in this particular book. I just want to make sure that everybody understands that this is his best thinking, and I do think it's the best work of Mylander and Anderson that I've ever seen. So moving on here, this is the part, I think, where where they nail it. You can see a picture of a young lady saying, yes, no, maybe. (laughs) And most of us think that way when there's been trouble when there's been an affront, when there's been a slight, when there's been a deliberate manipulation, when there's been any kind of evil directed against us or our family or our friends, etc. We think we have these three options. (laughs) But actually, we don't. Jesus tells us to forgive those who have trespassed against us, even as even as we've been forgiven. It's a it's a conditional application. But we you, you know this and I know this. It's a crisis of the will. Forgiveness pulls against what we think is just or right. Why those dirty, rotten, bleep, 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 they did this to my bleep, 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 and I want them to bleep, bleep, and we we say those kinds of things because we believe in justice and so does God. 
and we want to take revenge for offenses suffered. Trouble is, taking revenge only deepens the cycle. And in fact, God tells us to treat our enemies with kindness rather than to treat them with hatred and violence. Love your enemies, says Jesus. And in Romans 12, I think the manifesto for Christian living, <laughs> Paul just says, uh, don't exact your own revenge. Leave vengeance into the hands of God. He, he says that very clearly. But here's the, here's the practical application, and I think this is the most important part of the process. By failing to forgive, <sighs> those who have hurt you are still linked to your soul, and they're still hurting you. And so if you fail to forgive, every time there's one of these triggers to the memory, every time you see somebody who raises his or her eyebrow the way that that person hurts you that way does, you're going to go back to that moment and relive the thing. You're going to stand in front of the mirror and rehearse the violence, or you're going to remember, or you're going to stuff it and try and get away from it, and it will surface in your dreams at night. You're still linked to them. Now, here's the point that I think is beautifully made by Anderson and Mylander. We don't forgive someone for their sake. We do it for ours so that we can be free. Our need to forgive is not an issue between the offender and the offended. In other words, if violence has been done, if trouble has been done, if manipulations have happened, if there's been slander or sedition or undermining, if there has been sexual violence, if there's been a robbery, if there's been any of those matters, this is the, the Jesus command to forgive is not between you and the person. Jesus command to forgive is to bring you to a place of magnificent freedom so that you can move forward in kingdom applications. It's a relationship between God and us where this barrier called bitterness prevents the free movement of the spirit. I said this last week, bitterness is nothing more than old unforgiveness. And uh, there's nothing worse than a bitter Bible thumper. <laughs> I don't know if you ever met some of those old guys who are wounded and quote the scripture and beat you up with it. Usually it's because there's some issue in the background that they've never forgiven, some awful thing that still causes them to go back to the memory of what might have been. So let's move on. So what we have to do is to check, check the talk box. Will I forgive? It has to be yes. It can't be no and it can't be maybe. Now, there's an emotional component to this, and here it is. Uh, forgiveness is actually deciding. You're going you're gonna to weigh this thing out, and you're going to agree to live with the consequences of somebody's sin against you. And it's not going to, here's the reality. If they stole your money, they stole your money. <laughs> if, they, if they hurt you, they hurt you. If they wounded somebody that you love, they wounded somebody that you love. Now, that's not going to change. It's what, what can change is the, the reality of how you manage the crisis rather than how you live in yesterday's despair. Uh, you're going to pay the, you're going to live with those consequences whether you want to or not, whether you forgive or whether you don't forgive. The only choice we have in this is whether we'll do this in the bitterness of unforgiveness or in the freedom, excuse me, the freedom that comes from obeying the Lord in this matter and practicing forgiveness. So uh, let, let's ponder that for just a second. If there had, and I, and I have suffered, in fact, I've seen whole communities suffer because one or two people decided they wanted their way. And, um, and of course, everybody who has been on the wrong side of that wants to stop the one or two from wrecking it for everybody else. But that everybody else can move forward. They can make sure that that person doesn't do this again. But if they still live in the fact that this guy has done this to them, they're not going to move forward at all. And the guy's won. You don't want the person who did the violence to win. You want Jesus who absorbed violence in himself and created opportunity. You want him to win. And so it's actually a paradigm of the cross. It is extension. It's the extension of what it means to be a Christ follower. So here's the question. How do you forgive from your heart? Well, you know what, Stan, this, this one, you don't stuff it. The only way to forgive is to surface it. You have to acknowledge the hurt. You have to acknowledge the heat. And, you know, in, in polite company, we, we do this thing where we push down the, the, the realities of somebody's sin against us because 
we don't want to be inappropriate in some social context. I am sorry. If you want to see redemption, if you want to see restoration, if you want to see healing arise out of the wound that you've experienced, you're not going to get better by bleeding out with with a cover on it. You have to let the surface of the wound come to the front. You have to clean the wound. Then you have to sew up the wound. And then you have to put healing salve on it. And so <clears throat> you have to acknowledge it. And um, if your forgiveness, by, by the way, I, I will say this. There comes a moment where your emotion shifts. But you don't start with the emotion. You start with the decision. <laughs> you, you, the first thing you have to do is you have to say, man, that hurt. Oh, that was awful. My, I, the opportunity I thought I was going to walk into has been destroyed. Or my daughter, is, her education is going to be in trouble. Or my, my, my cousin has now been in a car accident and he's going to be in a wheelchair. And I mean, these are realities that everybody faces. And rather than, <laughs> you're not going to look at them and say, oh, you didn't mean it, it's done. Uh, and oh, by the way, forget it. And and you, every time you see your cousin in that wheelchair, you're going to think about how bad it is. And why did that awful jerk do this ugly thing? I, I just had a buddy of mine go through um, go through the, the loss of his son. His son was 32. There was a hit and run. And uh, that guy, he was he was crossing the street about two blocks from his home on Aaron. This guy hit him in the dark because the street wasn't well lit. There was huge damage to the car. Everybody knows he, he uh, was there. The guy drove away. His son died. I was at the funeral two weeks ago. He's not going to forget that. Here's what happened. The fella who did the hit and run was filled with remorse. He surrendered to the police about a week and a half later. And he said, I am so terrifically, horribly sorry for what I did. I don't know how I can make amends. The life is gone. I am so sorry. Now, reconciliation is possible, but you got to get past the wound. If those parents don't allow the wound to, to, to come to the surface, every time they look at that guy, they're going to remember this thing. So, um, there's a desire on the part of both of both parties to do this, but you have to know the wound is too fresh for mom and dad at this moment. He also had a girlfriend. The wound is too fresh for the girlfriend, for the mom, and for the dad. And this is never going to be bought back. The man is dead. He's buried. He's now before the Lord for his uh, for his reward, one way or the other. However, however, his walk with God was determined. But uh, here's what has to happen. When you have something horrible like that happen, even when there's remorse on the side of the offender, you still have to let the pain of the wound rise to the surface to bring it into the light. So uh, here, here's what I do when I'm counseling with people. And you, you and I have had this chat a couple of times. Um, I tell people to think of the situation and to put it in their hands and then to turn it over into the hands of Christ. We did that exercise a couple of weeks back. But uh, what I'd like to do right now is to say, you're not going to be able to do it unless you put yourself in the framework of receptivity to allow the Lord to surface the old wounds that are preventing you from moving forward into your future. This exercise takes time. Now, there are some wounds that are raw and they come to the surface as soon as you begin this. But there are other wounds that we've stuffed from our childhood. This, this is particularly clear with, uh, with sexual abuse. I, I have, I've dealt with many, many prisoners who were in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who have whole years of their lives blotted out of their memory because it hurts too much to think about what it was that happened to them. And it's usually violence married together with sexual abuse, and they stuff it because as little kids, they can't deal with this. Uh, it does hurt to allow those memories to surface. But they can be brought to a place of healing when the Holy Spirit moves on the heart of the afflicted one and these wounds become, be, begin to come to the surface. And then you've got to name some names and get specific. You have to name the fact, oh, that was Bill Blank who did this to me. He died now. I wanted to punch him in the face. I had no desire to see that guy ever again unless I could destroy him. I wanted to hide in a tree and take my gun and shoot him. So, you know, you have these crazy thoughts go through your head that are really ungodly. 
but those those feelings that are really ungodly are inside you. <laughs> so uh, rather than pretend you're not thinking the ugly thought, you're far better served to surface the ugly thought and to say it. In fact, you can see this even in Paul the Apostle. So he becomes an apostle. And in 1 Corinthians and in the pastoral epistles, he names the fact that he doesn't deserve what he's doing because he persecuted the church of God. In the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, he names the fact that he is not as he should have been because he hurt God's church. And so he confesses it. Even as he's talking about the hope of the resurrection in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Because the only way to the place of restoration is to surface the wound. Whether you're the one who's been aggrieved or whether you're the one who's done the dirty work, you have to surface this. So I tell people to get before the Lord and to take out a little notebook. So it, it, you know, it doesn't have to be a fancy thing. I just take a, any kind of notebook. This, this would do right here. Oh, that's, a, sorry, my apologies. Just any kind of notebook. Take something like this. Open it up to a blank page. And I like one of these coil books because <laughs> with a coil book, when you're done, you can tear the page out and burn the sucker. <laughs> so so what we do is we, we <laughs> you write the, the pain down. So um, let me go on with this. And you don't wait to forgive until you feel like it. And by the way, if you don't feel like it and you decide you have to wait till you feel like it, you're never going to forgive. Feelings take time to heal after the choice to forgive is made. Satan has lost his place um, in terms of your decision. And then just like a leg needs time to be restored by being put into a cast, your spirit needs to be restored with the passage of time. Freedom is what gain, not a feeling. And in time, your feelings will shift to the place in which the wound no longer matters. Now, I'm going to tell, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you this process, but uh, let me, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to stop my screen share for just a minute, and I'll go back to the process after this. So some years ago, I wound up accepting a church in Brampton, Ontario, and, um, and it was a great opportunity. There had been a pastor there for 14 years. He was a solid, wonderful pastor. He had moved on to a different assignment. It was now about a year and a half. After this pastor had moved, he was much loved, um, but he'd, he'd done good work. You know what I'm saying? It's, it was just, it was a church that had a solid background and a solid thing. And there were associate pastors on the staff. And um, I was going to what they call the candidation weekend. Okay. So that in, in my denomination, there is, um, there's a district superintendent and some other traditions, you'd call that a bishop. But in ours, the district superintendent has to approve the process you have to pass muster with the DS to make sure that you're in harmony with the statement of faith and the governance model, et cetera, that your life is, is consistent with the teaching of the movement, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd been through that process. And in our movement, that district superintendent has teeth. And so some movements have an honorary role for a bishop or a district superintendent. And it's uh, the movement I'm in. Uh, he has the right to remove a pastor who's an idiot or a board that's an idiot. <laughs> At any rate, he was, he was actually somebody I knew well, and I was praying with him about this assignment. And I said yes to the candidation process, and he was delighted, and the board of that church was delighted, and I was delighted. And the, the candidation weekend was supposed to start on a particular Friday afternoon and go through Friday, Saturday, Sunday, with me preaching on the Sunday and a congregational meeting on the Sunday night. That was the process. So I had met the staff, I had met the elders, I had met the anchor leaders. We had done what I call a pre-candidating time. I had preached the call kind of thing. And uh, it is going to be the following Friday, and it's Monday morning. And I'm getting up, having my prayer time. And I knew that my district superintendent always took Mondays off. The phone rings, and it's him. I thought, Monday. Why is he calling on a Monday? And he said, uh, David, I have something to tell you the associate pastor of that church, whose mother is one of the founders, who has been in that church since he was born, he has committed adultery. And I have no choice except to confront him and to take him out of the ministry until such time as he repents. That's a big wound in the side of that church because he's much loved. And he said, now I have to ask you this question. You were supposed to be going there this Friday 
to test out whether or not you're going to say yes to that congregation. Do you still want to do this? I said, oh, <laughs> what, what do I do? What do I do? So I said, I need to fast and pray. Give me 24 hours. I looked my wife in the eye and I said, we need 24 hours to do this. And so we, I had already had breakfast. So I skipped lunch. I skipped supper. And we prayed through the day, woke up the next day. And in my prayer time, I said to the Lord, what should I do? Should we go to that church? The role would be very different. Uh, under the old thing, I was coming into a healthy context to um, to begin again for a church that is well launched. And in this case, I'm going I'm going to move from being the leader to being the doctor. You know that kind of thing. I'm going to be tending the wounds of a congregation. The the role changed. Now I'm going to be the pastoral caregiver, the one who listens to the despair. And I'm a stranger. They they don't even know me yet. So I said, Lord, do I go? And I, I had this, these words floated up in my spirit. Do they not need a pastor? I said, well, now more than ever. And then the next words floated up. Why do you wait? So I went into that congregation. I passed through the weekend and only the district superintendent and the elders knew that the man had been taken out. He was not present to the candidation process. And nobody seemed to pay much attention because... You know, the, all of the attention was on the fact the new lead pastor is coming. Anyway, they go through the weekend. The congregation has a vote. Uh, it was almost unanimous. There was one or two dissenting votes, but just about the entire congregation said, yes, this is a wonderful thing. And then the DS stood up and said, now all the members have, to, uh, everybody except a member has to, has to exit the room. And he told them what happened. Went from elation to despair. And uh, they accepted me as the lead pastor, but I went in there and they were mad, hopping mad at the DS. They were hurt, hopping hurt at what happened. So here's what we did. Uh, over the course of time, we realized that this was not healing. There was a wound in the side of the church, the size of a Mack truck. It was this great big hole in the bottom of the, of the ship and the ship was always taken on water. Somebody was a prayer partner with my wife and I, and this lady said, we have to surface the wound. We have to see what we can do to heal the church. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck in yesterday. So my secretary and I sent a letter out to everyone who had been in the church and had been part of the church when this egregious wound happened. We brought them into a dedicated um, evening meeting on a Tuesday night. And I had chart paper at the front. And what I didn't know was that that pastor who had done what he'd done uh, decided that he would show up and sit in the back row for that process. Now, nobody knew he was there because he walked in at the very end of the, uh, of the entry point. And here's what I was doing with the group. I said, listen, the only way we're going to get past this wound is if we talk about what it is that we were feeling when this happened. Now, I've made a decision we're we're going to write down what people felt and so i took a, 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 a it was it was chart paper on purpose i took a black magic marker and i started to write down violation hurt shock um disappointment and i filled up seven seven large chart paper pieces of paper with the emotions of everybody who is gathered in that room and then after all the emotion was there, somebody said, I wonder how that pastor is doing. I said, turn around and ask him. <laughs> so, so they turned around and there he was. And everybody realized that all their emotion was now recorded. And he saw the recording of all the emotion and everybody started to cry. A number of people walked up and hugged him. And he said, what I did was wrong. It was terribly wrong. You did the right thing. And I'm sorry. And <laughs> you should have seen the response <laughs> of the congregation. It was just this. It didn't get better till we surfaced it. Now, here's what we did. One guy was angry and wrote down angry things. And uh, most people were just hurt, right? 
Then everybody sat back down again. I said, now listen, here's what we're going to do. We are Christ followers. We follow Jesus who commands us to forgive. These wounds are real, but we don't live in our emotion. We live in the decision to forgive and our emotions follow after. So with all the love that I can muster, we are going to say yet goodbye to the emotions that we are living in and we're going to move into the future. So I took all the chart paper. I said, this is being done in Jesus' name, and I know it's tender, and I know this hurts, but we're not going to live in the emotions of what happened. And I tore up the paper in Jesus' name. Then I took a large bowl, a salad bowl. I put the paper in there. I said, now we're going to go outside. We're going to sing Refiner's Fire, and we're going to burn the memory of all the violation that happened in that time. We sang Refiner's Fire as we burned the memory of the emotions. And as a direct result, the church doubled in size over the next year. The Lord brought us to a place of healing. Now, let me show you the process. I'll go back to my screen share. And uh, I'm going to tell people how to do this, okay? You start off by being still before the Lord. Then you ask Jesus to surface the pain you're dealing with and you write it down. Write it down. Don't, and by the way, make sure you can burn the thing if you want to or tear it up. Surface the pain. Let all of the emotion come out. Name the parties. Name the situation. Name the losses. Name the angry emotions. Write them all down. And then pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I forgive this person for this is what they did and then admit this really hurt wounded my life but i'm not going to live in yesterday it's now time to forgive i take them off my hook and trust them to yours for whatever will bring grace to their lives redeem their lives even as i trust you to buy back what i have lost through their sin against me in Jesus name. Amen. And you do that around every emotion, every violation, every sin, for every person or context that the Lord brings to mind for you. As you do that, there will be a release from bitter reflections on yesterday to the hope for a new future for tomorrow. That's how that works. So, Stan, what do you think of that? Well, uh, already uh, three or four people came to mind. Yes, <laughs> and there'll be more yet. <laughs> be more. And um, th that is very helpful to me because uh, I can remember now one of the most major ones yeah. was 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 deeply unfair, and you know when it would surface in me. Every time I went and took a shower, oh, okay. I have no idea why. But there I'm standing, kind of, you know, naked, yeah. but relaxed. And this name would come to me. That's because you were relaxing. Yeah, or so, whatever. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it is. Because you're at the place where you're starting to get to a place of comfort. Could it be God, the Holy Spirit, bringing it back to you? I don't know. Or could it be the enemy taking advantage? Well, but, I also, yeah, yeah. but I also yeah. realized that, you know, all of a sudden, about two or three years later, I remembered that I had forgotten. <laughs> and that, you know, ever since then, um, I, I have forgiven Bill. And I've reached out to him two or three times. He has been reluctant to respond that much because he knows mm -hmm. but I have forgiven him. And it really is, as you say, almost totally forgotten now. And so that's been very helpful to me. And also, I can't, a word came to me, you know, uh, the word came to me, convicts. <laughs> These are people that are in my forgiveness prison. I haven't let them out, <laughs> you know, that um, I haven't let them out yet. <laughs> I'm not keeping them in, in the prison of my unforgiveness. And um, that word, and I put that down on my chart here. And you know what? I'm. I'm going to literally go through that with the list of the convicts. Yeah. 
So uh, to all the listeners, to all those watching on YouTube or listening on the radio or listening on a podcast as you're driving in the car or sitting at home yeah. or working in the kitchen, I suspect the same thing happened to you. I suspect that you have names that have surfaced inside your heart. And I suspect some of you are feeling raw emotion right now. You don't want to forgive because it hurts so much. And you're going right back to the wound when it happened in the moment, in your memory. And you're stalled or you're stuck. The way to get that car of faith moving down the road of righteousness mm -hmm. once again is to sit down right where you are, take a pad of paper, surface the emotion, put it in the presence of Jesus, and hand it over. So let's let's bring some of that teaching to bear. Next week, I'm going to talk about the redemption of it and turning it around for that sake. But right now, here's the thing that needs to happen. If you're in the middle of that emotion, stop where you are, get yourself a little notebook, <laughs> write down all the names that surface, and then do this simple little thing. Picture it in your hands. Picture the hands of Jesus under your hands. And when you are ready to make this decision with your heart, your soul, your mind, and all your strength, turn your hands over to the hands of Christ and let him carry that. Do that. And then when you're done, take the, the note paper that you had, tear it up, burn it. May I just also, was I was this line, I, as a radio broadcaster, I love good one-liners because I know that helps me remember, you know, yeah. and helps you remember. And I think the line that got me in it, uh, I think it comes, when I forgive, Jesus wins. Yeah. When I forgive, Jesus wins, and we all want him to win. <laughs> yes, we do. That's now, right. the, the issue beyond this, how do I relate to this person? Uh, in the future, whole different category, right. absolutely, completely different category. Uh, that is something that you will deal with in a different manner after the Lord takes the pus off the wound in your heart. You need to be in a place of complete peace around the fact that someone violated you or hurt you before you get to the place where you are in a position to even want to consider facing the individual who did it. It's not wrong for a season not to re-engage with that person. Okay. In fact, it may be over. You may never re-engage with them again. And that that understanding, I think, is very freeing to us. Because in in the one case, uh, there, there's no way I can trust him yep. for what he did to my family. Of course not. <laughs> Maybe someday. But it's nice to know that is not in any way limiting my ability to let Jesus win. <laughs> yes. Well, now I'll, I'll finish up with a story I just told. That pastor who had committed adultery did so with a parishioner. So there were, there were two families. And uh, in the end, both of those marriages were saved, mm -hmm. but they worship in different churches. Yes. They didn't come back because they didn't want to be in a position where the memory would create trouble in their marriage to each other. They didn't want that. And so um, I'm thankful that their marriages were spared, but that pastor could no longer serve that church right. because the trust bond had been violated to such a degree that it was next to impossible to restore it. Right. So when the day is done, um, we have to recognize forgiveness is not forgetting and forgiveness is not restored relationship and forgiveness is not trust. Forgiveness is not treating people as their sins deserve and forgiveness is an active um, submission of the wound to the hands of Jesus. That brings you to a place of freedom. I think that's uh, that's enough to ponder. And next week, we're going to look at how the Lord can redeem our stupidities and turn them into opportunities. I look forward to your uh, teaching. Thank you. As I pointed out, uh, you know, uh, I had that piece of paper and uh, I wrote down those names of some people who uh, are in my convict list. You know, I've kind of convicted them of some of the things that they've done to me, and uh, they're kind of in my uh, unforgiveness jail. And so I'm trying to work very, very hard and uh, follow his pattern and his program so that uh, I may have the power that will come to me and the grace that will come to me in which I... Uh, 
really do what Jesus said we must do. You know, I've forgiven you, and now you pass it on to others. Remember, this is a time, and this is a season, and this is a way for us to put into practice what we're all about. Uh, the prayer formula of Dr. David, R, you know, R, righteousness, J, joy, and peace. Righteousness, joy, and peace, and that's what Christmas is all about. And so I would ask you to join me in celebrating that and uh, bringing it into the new year. And of course, uh, let's recall just exactly what he said. Uh, to have a better tomorrow. Okay, here we go now. Be still before the Lord. Let Jesus surface the pain. Pray this simple prayer. Lord, I forgive for it really hurt. It wounded my very life. Yet now is the time to forgive. I, I take them off my hook and trust them to yours. Yours for whatever will bring grace to their lives. Redeem their lives even as I trust you to buy back what I have lost through their sin. In Jesus' name. Good stuff. Great stuff. Practice it. And as uh, Dr. David reminds us, thank you to Neil Anderson and Charles Mylander, colleagues in prayer and mentors in the practice who uh, helped us develop this wonderful, thoughtful, and helpful, and certainly God-inspired, spirit-directed way of learning and understanding truly how we can have more power in uh, praying the Jesus way and following him every day. I'm Stan Houston for uh, Dr. David and the team here at uh, Spirit Equip. Please reach out to us at spiritequip.com, spiritequip.com, and let's see how working together we can make sure that 23 will be perhaps one of the best years ever. And starting right now, this might be one of the great Christmases in our life as we truly decide to pray the Jesus way and forgive others. Best and blessings to you. Till next time, bye for now.